Psalm 118, 24 says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So I'd like everyone to stand, and we're going to sing praises to God and rejoice in God for this wonderful day that he's given us. <laughs> Glory to his name. 
I'm going to let you catch your breath and my breath, and you can be seated for a while here. So um, we've been singing about the blood of Jesus, the blood that he shed on the cross for us, and not just the blood, but the power in that blood. Um, the plan of salvation came from that blood that he shed on the cross, and he did it because he loves us. And so I want everyone to join in on this very old hymn. I know you're all going to know it. So join me as we sing the old rugged cross. Shine. 
minutes and we're going to pray. Lord, we thank you for all the difficult times that you've already brought us through in life. The dangers, the toils, and the snares. And we're just so grateful that you love us and that you care about the things that weigh us down. And we know that you tell us to cast our heartaches and our cares on you. And in return, you promise that you'll give us peace and rest. Help us, Lord, to just be able to let go and um, just trust you so that we can receive healing for our broken hearts. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers, for answering our prayers. And we thank you, Lord, for the friendship that you give us. And as we begin this next song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, I want you to feel free to keep your heads bowed if you'd like to continue to pray to the Lord about whatever's heavy on your heart. And um, if you want to sing, join in with singing. You may do that as well. We're going to sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to going over this song the past week, there were two phrases in the last verse that really stood out to me. And I even asked the tech team um, to put them up on the screen for you to see. The words say, soon in glory, bright, unclouded, talking about when we get to heaven, that's glory, there will be no need for prayer. And I thought, you know, I've never really thought about that concept. I mean, my brain knows that. But I never thought about that. Something that we do maybe on a daily basis, hopefully here on this earth, um, having conversations with the Lord and, and asking him to help us in the different areas in our life. And, and we won't have a need for prayer in heaven. Um, that's because we won't have any health issues, um, relationship issues, no financial worries. No anxiety, no depression, loneliness, mental illness, no addictions, no hatred. We just won't have a need for prayer. So um, the fact is, this is not our home. We're not from here, and we're just passing through, and our final destination is a place of joy. And the next two songs we're going to sing about the hope and the joy that's to come for those of us who have asked Jesus into our lives. And so I'm going to have everyone stand, and we're going to sing a really old gospel hymn called I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. 
die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all seated and we're at this time we're going to have Lisa come forward and the children come forward for children's time all right well I needed to ask you guys a question Donna was singing a song about um, how we could have a broken heart and that when we're sad we can cast our cares on to God did you know that we can be the cause of somebody's broken heart do you guys know that that's not a very good feeling. What if a new kid came to school or to your neighborhood or to Awana or somewhere where you're playing with other kids and you didn't include them? And you're like, oh, that's the new kid. We're not going to, we've got our friends. We're not going to talk to that new kid. How do you think that makes them feel? Sad. Sad? Do you think? <gasps> did, did it make you feel sad? Yeah. And then when we do it to somebody, we need to realize that it makes them feel sad. What about if it was somebody, maybe a friend that you've had for a long time, and they came in wearing a new coat or a new jacket, and you didn't like it. You thought it was ugly, and you told them so. How do you think it made them feel? Sad. Sad. But it's your friend. You're just teasing. It shouldn't make them sad. They should know you enough that even though you thought their jacket was ugly, that you still like them. Do you think that's enough? What if they come and you see your friend again and you don't like the way their hair is done? And you're like, your hair is so goofy today. What? Embarrassing. Your friend might get embarrassed. And you know what? Your friend might kind of shrug it off and be like, ah, it's okay. I know they're just teasing. Well, what if a couple weeks later, your friend comes in and, and maybe your friend is trying to read in school or something, and you all start laughing because your friend can't read as fast as you can, or maybe you're out running on the playground and they can't climb the slide like you can, and your friends and you, you all laugh and giggle and maybe even point and say, you know, about, oh, you're just slow. And you know what? What if your friend turns around and runs out and your friend is no longer your friend? But you were just teasing. It shouldn't hurt that bad. What do you guys think? If it happened to you, would it, would it hurt? Would it maybe break your heart? Would you maybe not want to be around friends anymore that tease like that? Well, the Bible has something very important to say about that. And I need somebody that would like to help me read it. Who wants to? Who has never helped me read up here? You haven't, Claire? Okay. All right, Claire. So look, when I open my Bible, it's like right to the middle. It's in the middle of the Bible. Can anybody tell me what book they can think I'm going to open to? Psalms. Psalms, that's right. And it's in the Old Testament. So we're going to open to Psalms with my lovely Mother's Day bookmark that Brielle made me. All right, so we're going to go to chapter 141. And what number is that little tiny number? Can you see it? There's a two, and then what's that one? Three. Okay, so I'm going to read it and you follow along. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. So, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. That's a tough verse. Can you guys see it from all the way over there? Can you? Can, can you see it? Oh, well, I don't have one of those big print editions. So... 
I wrote it out here so you could see it. So this is what Claire and I just read. We found it in Psalm 141, verse 3. And it said, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Everybody put your hand on your mouth. Now you can't say anything because you're covering your mouth. Well, this doesn't, you can take your hands down. This doesn't mean don't let me say anything. It's talking, who's it talking to? What does it say right here? Maisie? What does it say right there? Oh, Lord. It's talking to God. And it's saying, this verse is telling us that we're to say, Lord, put a guard over my mouth. That means guard it so I don't say something that will hurt my friends. So I don't say something that will be displeasing to God. That whatever comes out of my mouth will be encouraging to my friends, will lift them up, will bring glory and praise to God's name. God, put a guard over my mouth. You guys know what a guard is, right? Like a soldier or they guard places and make sure nobody can get in, nobody can get out like a guard. Well, we want God to do that. When we are thinking of saying something mean to our friends or teasing them, we need God to put a guard over our mouths to block it so we don't say something that will hurt somebody. And then it goes on to say, keep watch over the door of my lips. We don't really have a door on our lips, do we? But it means every time we open our mouths, every time those lips are moving, it better be to glorify God. That means if we see somebody who maybe... I don't know, talks different than us or we don't like the way that they play a game instead of saying something mean, we're going to ask God to watch my lips, watch when I open my mouth, that I don't say something that will hurt a friend, okay? So we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Now you're probably wondering what all these buckets are for. Everybody come get a bucket. Everybody got a bucket? Okay, I tried to cut off all the thorns, so I hope you don't get poked. Here you go. Go ahead. It's, it's really, I don't think there's any thorns. Here, help me out. Pull that. Okay, you guys ready for this? This is what we're going to do. You are going to pick up your rows, and one by one, put your bucket on the ground. You're going to need your bucket on the ground. Get close to your bucket, because what you're going to do, one by one, she's going to time, and we're going to see how long it takes you to pluck off every petal of your rose. Are you ready? One by one. Now, when you get to the center, they get harder to do one by one, so you can start grabbing more than one. But let's try with those big petals one by one. Now, this is not a competition to see who finishes first. We want a total time of how long it takes to get all the petals off of all of those roses. So put the petals in your bucket when we say go. Are you ready? Everybody understand what you're to do? Okay. And if you need help, I'll come around and help you. All right, Lauren, kids, on your mark, get set, go. Get those petals off, not the leaves. Don't worry about the leaves. Pull the petals off. Petals off. Take the petals off. Here, let's help. Ready? Pull your petal off. Just the petals. Pull all these pretty petals off. Do you see what to do? You need help? Here we go. Let's pull them off. And as soon as you're done, stand up so Lauren knows. And then once everybody's standing up, okay, pull them off. There you go. Keep pulling them all these. Pull them all off. Once you're done, stand up. Come on, come on, come on. You guys can do it. Get those petals off. Pull them off, pull them off, pull them off. Ooh, some are getting really close. Finley is almost done. Oh, you got one tiny little petal there. All right, stand up. Okay, who else is close? Let's, oh, Maisie's done. You're almost done, Abby. Got a couple little tiny petals. Go, go, go. You can do this. Do you need some help? You doing okay? Look at all those petals. All right, Riker stands up. Stop. How long? A minute and 21 seconds. <gasps> Give yourself a pat on the back. That was the fastest I have ever seen a rose lose all its petals. Okay. Even the leaves. All right, everybody sit back down. Don't move far from your bucket. Okay, Lauren, are you ready? Okay, Lauren's going to set another stopwatch. You guys ready? Okay. Okay, Lauren, on the count of three, you guys are going to put all the petals back on your rows. Okay, are you ready? On your marks, get set, go. Come on. Let's get those, let's get those petals back on. Stick them back on. Make it just as beautiful as before. Come on. Why aren't they sticking? What's, oh man. Okay, stop, stop them. What's wrong? 
Somebody tell me why you can't get those petals back on. You took them off. You pulled them off. Can you put a rose's petals back on just the way they were? <laughs> Yeah, you could use glue, but that's not the way it started out, is it? It's not as pretty. Okay, let's read this verse again. Look over here. Psalm 141.3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Each one of those petals is to represent something not nice, something mean you might have said. Abby, those petals they're to remind you that when you say something mean or you're teasing a friend and it hurts their feelings, when you say something that God would make God sad, you can't take it back, huh? If you say something mean to a friend, you can't take it back, just like you can't put those petals back on that rose. And you still remember it, don't you? You know what? People have said things to me when I was little and I still remember them. I still remember. And it hurt when I was little. I'm older now and I've been able to forgive them and I've been able to move on. But when they said it, it hurt. Okay, so we can't put the petals back on. We cannot take back the mean things we say. What should we do? Claire? Finley? Riker? Brielle? What should we do when we say something mean to somebody? Or if we remember that we said something that we thought was just teasing, what should we do? We need to make it right. We may not be able to ever put those petals back on the rose, Claire. But you know what? We can go and apologize, can't we? We can tell them, I'm so sorry. You know what? I said that, and it was wrong. And I'm sorry. You are my friend, and I don't ever want to hurt you. So we need to make it right with two people, though. The Bible says, hold on, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, and a lot of you know this from Awana, I bet, if we conf you can say it with me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we do something wrong, when we say something wrong or we tease somebody, even if we didn't realize we were doing it, we need to make it right with God first confess it to him, tell him you're sorry, and he promises to forgive you. But then we need to go to that person, and we need to tell them we're sorry. Well, so what do you guys think? Think you can ever figure out a way to get those petals back on there? No, but I bet you now when you see a rose, you'll think of it a little bit differently, huh? Roses are beautiful, just like each one of us. God has made each one of us beautiful. So let's not hurt each other, okay? So remember that when you go out this week, I don't want to rip a petal off of somebody. I want to make sure that what I say makes them love Jesus more and feel encouraged, okay? I'm Paul Miller, one of your elders, and uh, let's close our eyes in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together today. We thank you for the improvement in restrictions and for your blessing uh, this era of COVID slowly coming to a close. Father, thank you again for um, the chance to be together, and I just pray for your protection over us. Keep us all healthy and strong so that we can honor you and please you with our lives. Thank you, Father, for this service. I pray that every aspect would be uh, causing each of us to walk closer with you and to apply your truths in our lives throughout this week. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to continue on in our series on John as we uh, continue on and pick up in uh, chapter 6. Uh, last week we were talking about food and uh, why we feast. You may remember that. I presented the idea that food, the, that food is symbolic of grace. It's external to us. It's something that we can't manufacture within ourselves. It becomes like this symbol within Scripture of God's grace. And we can see God's grace in the provision of food for us. It's abundant and varied, at least it is here in the United States. And, and, and to, to just kind of drive home that point, you just look at the flavors. We talked about that last week. I mean, I'm salivating just thinking about food right now. Um, there's abundant provision just in the flavors. You think of oranges and bacon and watermelon and apple pie, and I could go on and on and on of all of these great flavors as your tummy rumbles and you're thinking, hmm, when's lunch? But we're not done with chapter 6 yet. 
And so we uh, introduced the idea of food last week in the feeding of the 5,000. But Jesus continues to talk about food the next day as he talks to the people on the other side of the lake where, from, from where that miracle occurred. Uh, you may, may remember that it was on the other side of the lake that he, t- that he continues to have this conversation about food. And the subject of that conversation really is about where do we get our sustenance from? How do we sustain ourselves uh, and, and, and what do we rely on to keep us going? Now, we have a lot of choices today for sustenance, and, and one of those choices that we have available to us is the energy drink. Now, a quick perusal of the energy drink section of any grocery store aisle or any convenience store reveals there are a lot of choices, and I, I've just selected a few here that we have available to us. Of course, we have the the granddaddy of all energy drinks, which is Red Bull. And um, in my mind, um, Red Bull is proof that you don't have to make something good and to get people to buy it, because <laughs> it's terrible. But nonetheless, um, they sold about $2.5 billion worth of Red Bull last year, um, which is obscene, um, to be honest with you. But, but, there, but in, all in all, the industry has sold eight billion dollars worth of energy drinks a year. And this has been going on for several years. And of course, every manufacturer is in the business of getting these energy drinks out now. So everybody, Coca-Cola's got an energy drink. Everybody's got an energy drink, right? So maybe a, another one that we might recognize, um, because energy drinks are closely associated with being a rock star. So why wouldn't, right? right? Isn't it? No? You don't go, oh, Rockstar Energy Drink, right? Well, they're trying to make that possible, right? Uh, uh, Rockstar Energy Drink. By the way, um, Red Bull, 114 milligrams of caffeine. Rockstar, 160 milligrams of caffeine. So we're, we're up in the uh, equation here just a little bit. But not to be outdone because, I mean, there's always more, right? Um, there's this company that's making NOSH. You know, of course, nitrous oxide makes your car go faster, so why wouldn't it make you go faster, right? That didn't even make any sense. But nonetheless, uh, that's what they've called this thing. And um, it has a whopping 200 milligrams of caffeine in it. So we just keep uh, ramping it up, right? Every time we come out with something new, we got to get a little bit more of something. And, um, and then this last one that I saw, and I thought this one was interesting because, of course, in our culture, um, everything's got to be organic. And um, so now we have Guru, the organic energy drink. Which, if you just think about that one, that was just, that's ridiculous. I mean, energy drinks, by their very existence, are putting something unnatural into your body. And here they're trying to put a natural, unnatural thing into your body. But whatever. Um, so there you go. Energy drinks. Um, so, so that's what we have. But what is an energy drink for, really? Right? It's to provide energy. That's why it's called an energy drink, obviously. But why does it even exist? And the purpose is to give you a quick shot of the right chemicals to your body to keep yourself going. That's why you have an energy green. The, the, I didn't even put the, the, what is now the most popular one up here, which is five-hour energy, which is an energy shot. So you can get yourself 160 milligrams of caffeine in four ounces, which is just <sighs> terrible. But anyway, um, when, you, when you break it down, the reason for an energy drink, when you really break it down to its basic, you know, what's happening there, is that you're trying to trick your body into believing that you've had sustenance. That's really what you're doing. You, you're trying to make your body think that you've eaten something real, something that will sustain your body in whatever endeavor that you're currently pushing to do. So whether that's, you know, stay up for 36 hours because you had to study for a final, or, or maybe you got an all-important uh, meeting and, and you're trying to get, get amped up for that pitch, or maybe you just skipped a meal and you're dragging. Yeah, it kind of sounds good right now, actually. No, I won't. But, but really, an energy drink is just a quick fix, isn't it? I mean, that, that's all it is. By definition, it's a quick fix. And I looked it up. Cambridge Dictionary actually has quick fix as a word. And they define it this way, something that seems to be a fast and easy solution to a problem, but is in fact not very good and will not last long. That's a quick fix, right? It's not very good and it will not last long, but that's how our culture works, isn't it? 
Now, by and large, I mean, don't we? We kind of work that way. We run around trying to find quick fixes, quick solutions to our problems, whether they're physical, relational, or spiritual. We want a quick fix. And when we come through the door to church on a Sunday morning, many of us are running on empty. I mean, some of us came to church this morning and it was like our last bit of spiritual energy just to get up to get here. And so we, we come through the door and we're expecting to get that five-hour fix of energy on a Sunday morning for our spiritual lives. And then we go home and we expect that five-hour fix to somehow last us throughout the entire week. But that's not what it's defined. That's not how it's supposed to work. And so we wonder why we're dragging and returning to old bad habits on Monday afternoon. Here's why. Church was never intended to be your only fix. Church was never intended to be your only meal. You, you come to worship this morning. This is not supposed to be your only spiritual input. We can't come and have one spiritual input and then ignore that side of ourselves the other six days of the week. Imagine, just imagine that if you were to eat every Saturday, you were to eat a huge feast. We talked about feasts last week. You were to eat a huge feast every Saturday and then not eat the whole rest of the week. What would a doctor say your diet is? suicide. At the very least, they would say it's unhealthy, right? They would call it unhealthy because that is an unhealthy way to live. If you want to thrive physically, then you, you know that you have to have a healthy diet. If you want to have the kind of energy that's sustainable and gets you through things without help, without the energy drinks, then you have to eat healthy and you have to change the diet. You have to eat regular healthy meals and exclude the things that aren't good for you. Well, that doesn't sound like very much fun. Moving from an unhealthy spiritual life to a healthy spiritual life is no different. It's the same thing in our lives. You have to have the right diet and the right diet isn't necessarily eating more. I can attest to that. Right? Right? Throughout the week, you can eat all sorts of spiritual, quote unquote, food. There's a lot out there in our culture. Our culture is great at producing spiritual food. There are people out there who claim they can recenter you, whatever that is, that you can find your balance. I still don't know what that is. That's, there, there's spiritual food out there, to be sure, but is any of it really good for you? That's the question. So you need to be eating the right things if you're going to be spiritually healthy. If you really want to be healthy, then you know you got to get help from experts. Because there's a lot of choices out there. We all do. I need to make sure that I sustain my spiritual life in a healthy way as well. Look, I, I can deliver the best sermon ever on a Sunday morning. I'm not saying I have. I'm just saying it's theoretically possible. Okay? So, so I can deliver the best sermon ever, but if I don't feed myself in between Sunday to Sunday, then all that means is that I know good food when I see it. It's really all that I'm doing. It's all I'm accomplishing. So knowing what good food might look like doesn't mean that I've taken it in. If I look at food and I don't consume it, I'm just as spiritually starved as I was before. If I don't feed myself throughout the week, that, that great sermon, that message, that good Bible study, whatever it is, is not going to be well applied to my life. In fact, what's going to happen is it's probably going to cause more problems in my life than solutions. Let's circle back to the physical. When someone has been starved you're aware that you can't just give them a big rich meal right off the bat. Somebody's been living without a regular good diet. If you give them rich food right off the bat, what happens? They throw it all back up again. They eject it. They expel it. They get rid of it. They can't handle it. It's not good for them. You have to go slow and bring them back. There's no quick fix to that. You were starving and maybe you're starving spiritually, and so you just eat whatever you can find. It's often how our culture looks at things. 
I just eat whatever. It's fine. Whatever looks good will keep me going. So people run on sweets because who doesn't like sugar, right? The soft answers, the easy solutions that are pleasant to swallow, I like those. They don't take much effort. And people do that and they think they're solving their spiritual need, but they aren't. They're just increasing the depth of their starvation. If you really want an ultimate healthy diet, your best option is to talk to a dietitian who knows, who can analyze your body, analyze what your needs are, analyze the workload that you have, and come up with a diet that's specially formulated just for you. And then you have to follow their plan. That takes the discipline, right? And so, as we uh, continue in this uh, little mini-series, last week we talked about feasting, and I needed to give you this caveat that you can't just feast. you got to have a healthy diet. So we're looking at Jesus and how he describes himself as the ultimate diet, and not only that, but the ultimate dietitian. He's the ultimate physician that can help us figure out what the ultimate diet is. So... As we read in our passage last week, John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. So verse 35, he says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I am the bread of life. So this is Jesus' statement about himself. Whoever comes will never hunger, and will never thirst. In other words, Jesus isn't a quick fix. Quick fixes are temporary at best. He's the ultimate meal, the meal that you keep dining on. He's the ultimate drink. There's a, there's a can, if you will, with Jesus, and that's all there is on the side of the can. No other ingredients necessary to list. He's everything that you need for your life. And then his next statement gets everyone grumbling because the next statement is that statement, I've come down from heaven. Verse 41, he says, or the passage says, so the Jews grumbled about him because I am the bread that, comes down, that came down from heaven. They said, isn't that this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I have come down from heaven? They're saying, look, how can Jesus be from heaven? How is that even possible? I mean, we know his parents. Look, there's Mary right there. Things from heaven don't have parents. That's what they think. They just show up all full grown, I guess. So he can't be from heaven. I mean, after all, I knew him since he was this big. This kid, how can he say he's from heaven? And of course, Jesus is continually telling people throughout the book of John, throughout his gospel, he's telling people, look at the evidence. When John, and it was recorded in Matthew, sends his disciple to Jesus, Jesus says, go back and tell him the evidence. John the Baptist goes and tells, sends his disciples to Jesus, says, go back and look at the evidence. So Jesus is constantly saying, look at the evidence for my statement. A large portion of this crowd on this occasion had been there the previous day. To be fed when he fed the 5,000. They had pursued him around the lake. They found him then. So this por- there, there's a portion of this crowd that had been fed on five loaves and two fishes, and they're going, how can this guy be from heaven? Now, if you remember, the preamble to that story is the people, the large crowd was following Jesus because of the signs he was doing. So they followed him because of the signs And they're still questioning whether or not he can be from heaven. What were they really following? What were they really pursuing? But as further evidence that Jesus isn't from around here, we have the event that starts in verse 16, which we skipped last week. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. 
So after feeding the crowd, Jesus goes off by himself to pray, and he directs his disciples, you go on ahead without me, I'll catch up to you later. Now, if I'm a disciple, I'm going, if I'm going to go out in a boat, how are you going to catch up to me later? But they obviously trusted him. Okay, he tells us to go, he'll catch up to us, that's fine. So remember now, there's at least four fishermen in the group, right? There's Peter and Andrew, his brother, and there's James and John. They were all fishermen, okay? So they're not unfamiliar with boats, and they know the Sea of Galilee like the back of their hand, all right? So these men were not amateurs, but a strong wind was blowing, it says. Now, I don't know if you were here last December when Greg spoke on this subject, but the Sea of Galilee rests down in a valley between a whole bunch of mountains, and the winds come down off of those mountains and across the Sea of Galilee. And so they were in, in one of those situations. They were encountering a, encountering a strong wind, and the passage says they had been out in the water for a while. It's three or four miles they'd been rowing, and they were probably exhausted because who wouldn't be? after that length of time. Now, John doesn't reference any alarm at waves because he's a fisherman and he's writing his own gospel account, so he's not going to look, you know, make himself look like that, but Matthew does. Matthew's like, ah, we were scared, but Matthew's a landlubber. He's a tax collector. He's naturally less comfortable on the water, so he was afraid. Regardless, they've been ro working against these waves for several hours. They just weren't making any headway at all. And then they see Jesus. And that's when they get afraid. Why? Because just like you or me, that ain't natural to see somebody walking across the water. And they're thinking, it's a ghost. It's got to be. But then Jesus says, it is I, which is just not natural English at all. Nobody says that. But we actually kind of lose the punch when we translate the Greek into the English because the Greek in this phrase is ego eimi, and that means I am. Ego eimi is the exact same phrase that, is tra that translates every Hebrew usage of that phrase in the Old Testament, I am. So when Moses is at the burning bush, and God said, and he asks God, Who's, who shall I say sent me? And God says, I am. It's translated in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, ego eimi. So Jesus says, I am, fear not. And then they were glad to take him into the boat. That's what it says. Once they understood who it was, they were glad, and they took him into the boat. And we actually lose the translation there as well, because the Greek word there is lambano. It's the exact same word that John uses in John 1.12. It means received. In John 1.12, he says, to as many as received him who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. They received him into the boat. So Jesus, here's, the, here's the, the, the schedule of events. Let's keep the facts straight. Jesus walks across the water. They're afraid. He says, I am. Fear not. They received him. And instantly they were at where they were supposed to be going. Do you see that in the passage? Instantly they arrived. Here they'd been struggling on their own strength for hours trying to get across that lake. Jesus says, I am, they receive him, and instantly they're where they're supposed to be going. <laughs> it's symbolic, but that's real. That's just not natural, is it, though? None of the events that occur in that passage are natural. And people don't walk across water. People don't, uh, you know, they, they, they don't instantly arrive at their destination after, be, you know, when they're out at sea. They don't just suddenly appear at shore. None of that's natural. People... People don't get fed by, you know, the thousands off of five loaves and two fishes. That's not natural. No, you're right, it's not. It's miraculous. But the crowd was grumbling because this crowd, they didn't see any of that. In fact, they go looking for Jesus at where they saw him the previous day, and he's not there. And then they rush around the sea trying to find him, and they eventually catch up to him, and they're like, how did you get here? They didn't see any of that. So they thought they knew Jesus. They thought they knew the natural Jesus, the one who grew up down the street. Nobody, nobody that grows up that way could be God, could they? 
And so they grumble against what he's saying because they've missed the signs. And so in verse 43, Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. I am the bread of life. There it is again. Ego e me. I am. In this case, I am the bread of life. This is the first of many numerous I am statements that that Jesus is going to be recorded in John as saying. Um, In chapter 8, he'll say, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, he'll say, I am the gate. He'll also say, I am the good shepherd. In chapter 11, he'll say, I am the resurrection and the life. In chapter 14, he'll say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In 15, he'll say, I am the true vine. All of them, ego e me, I am. Jesus takes that name that God calls himself, that in Hebrew would never, ever, you would never even come close to uttering it on your own, and Jesus describes it to himself. He says, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna, but that, that was just a quick fix. They all died. I am the ultimate bread of life. If you eat the bread that comes out of heaven, you won't die you'll live. So rewind. Let's go back to that feeding of the 5,000 that we dealt with last week. That's yesterday, by the way, in their, in their timeline. Yesterday, he fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Clearly, he isn't referring to, food, to bread made with flour when he says, I am the bread of life. There has to be something else. There has to be. So in verse 51, he reveals what it is. It's it's my flesh. My body will provide the life for the whole world. Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were stuck. It would be easy to find fault with the people. I mean, we have to remember that, that they pursued him because they got fed. They wanted more of that. That was pretty awesome. They got the ultimate Red Bull, if you will. They want another fix. (laughs) That's their context. So when he starts talking about food and manna, they're thinking, sweet. I have read about manna ever since I was a little kid. I can't wait to try some. He's going to give us some right now, isn't he? And then when he says, no, it's my flesh that you have to eat, they're like, whoa, what, 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 what? The language changes, and they're just like, "Hmm, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Now, we, of course, we can look at that with the benefit of the Holy Spirit, 2,000 years of theology being written about it, and we know exactly what Jesus is talking about there. But, But for them, that's really hard to believe. Eat your flesh? Drink your blood? How can he give us his flesh to eat? And even if he does, I'm not eating it. Gross! cannibalism, ew. And Jesus goes on and he doesn't make it any easier for him. He continues in verse 53, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Ew, this is just getting weird. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. I mean, it's a really weird passage if you read it without any context, right? It's no wonder that the Romans thought that the Christians were cannibals. My flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. It's just odd. 
that even the, the people that considered them his disciples were put off by this. Look at verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? This is just weird, Jesus. You just went out and left field. I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. So what does it mean? I'm not going to go into a full exposition on this. We just don't have time. But, but let me unpack it just a little bit. Remember way back in verse 1 of chapter 1, back the first week of the year, we talked about this verse, in which Jesus says that he is the Word. Or, in the, or John says that Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So then in this passage, in chapter 6, with that background, Jesus is the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, Jesus says that it wasn't Moses that provided manna for the people. It was God. Just correcting a little bit of theology for them, maybe. The Israelites were wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. They would have starved to death if God hadn't provided for them, and He did. He provided manna for them. We know that story. So that was a physical provision only. They needed more manna every day except for on the Sabbath in which they collected the day before for two days, and that was fine. So Moses reminds the people of this in Deuteronomy 8.3. He says, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Your provision is from God. The purpose of manna was so that people would recognize that their provision didn't come from any effort of their own. It couldn't have. Previously unknown and ever since then never seen again. This was a, this was a singular experience just for them. God spoke and there it was. Moses says they were sustained by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus, you may remember this passage, goes into the wilderness for 40 days Without, without eating, fasting for 40 days, and his first temptation is what? Bread. Turn these stones to bread. And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3 and says, man does not live by bread alone, but on, by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John, or Jesus says in verse 51, I am the bread that is, that I, excuse me, I am the bread that I give for the life of the world. It is my flesh. He sacrifices himself, that sacrifice of himself, the word who proceeds from God the Father, provides life. So the word that proceeds from God actively provides life through his bodily sacrifice. That's how we're ultimately sustained from every word. Oh yeah, it's the word of God too. Yes. But Jesus is the Word. So when John and James' mother asked Jesus if he would give them the best seats in the kingdom, Matthew 20, 22 says, Jesus answered, you don't even know what you're asking. No concept of what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm to drink? And they said, yeah, we're able. We can do that. Yeah, we're down with that. Whatever, bring it on. We're there. I just need me a Red Bull first, Jesus. And he said to them, you will drink my cup. And what's the cup? It's Jesus' way. It's, it's, it's suffering and death and humility and sacrifice. He willingly gave of himself so that we might have life and have it to the full. Would they drink of his cup? Absolutely they would. Those men would know suffering and death and humility and sacrifice. And then in Luke 22, we see the cup and bread become symbolic at the communion table. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Remember that this is Passover. <laughs> and what does it say at the beginning of chapter 6? Passover was near. Jesus is giving this symbolism all the way through chapter 6 of saying, I am the afikomen. I am the bread that was hidden 
but now has been found. So the elements of the table are symbolically his body and symbolically his blood. We symbolically take in what we have spiritually really taken in when we accept Jesus, when we receive him, when we lambano him. His sacrifice then is poured out for us, to us, in us. But the crowd doesn't have the hindsight, the blessing of hindsight and his statements there at the table. So the crowd disperses. They can't handle what he's saying. It's just, it's just too hard. They wanted, they wanted an energy drink. They wanted sweets. And Jesus just served up a huge portion of kale salad. Whoa. So he turns to the 12 and he says, are you going to leave? You, the ones that I called, were you looking for a quick fix too? But Peter says, where else would we go? Where else would we go? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Where can we go? It's all well and good to have cake for a special event. No offense, Lisa. You, you can have ice cream for dessert all you want to, but it's just the end. It's just the palate cleanser. It's just something extra. You can't live on it. What you live on is real food, real nourishment. You have to have the, the whole food pyramid thing going on in your life. And Peter says, your words are that. Your words are eternal life. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So you're it. You're the one that has life. Where else would we go? You're the one that decides what healthy even is. <laughs> As Peter testifies before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, there is, no, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The crowd, the crowd with Jesus wanted someone to show them that they were still the people of God, maybe. You know, honestly, we're not that much different today. We want a powerful Jesus who does miracles that make us ooh and ah like so much 4th of July fireworks. Maybe it's walking on water. Maybe you'll feed miraculously. Maybe you'll heal a blind man. Ooh, ah. We love energy drinks. Love them. But they're quick fixes. They weren't intended to sustain are we really interested in the bigger, more convincing things of life? Are we really interested in, in when, when he tells us how to live, are we interested in living that out in our lives? Are we interested when he says, hey, you'll drink from my cup, you're going to have a life of suffering and privation and maybe some humility. Are we willing to take that up and go with it? Are we interested in being spiritually fit or are we just wanting enough to get us through the week. Uh, that's good enough. The great theologian Bear Grylls of Man vs. Wild said, food equals energy, energy equals movement. <laughs> How much can the church move in today's culture? How much can we impact our culture? How much can we bring of the kingdom here, now, in this place, around this building, in the community out there, at this time and in this place? The answer lies in how good our diet is. Nothing short of a good diet will do. How much do we feed on the body and blood of Christ? How much do we depend on his grace in our lives? How much do we depend on his word? Is it just once a week? Well, we're not going to have much energy. We won't move very far, according to Bear Grylls. But if we will stick to a diet rich in spiritual food, then we will have the energy to sustain the race that he set before us. So let's run so that we can win. In order to do that, we have to listen to Jesus on what that diet should look like. We have to be feasting every day on his word. What has God given you today from his word? We have to be, to be, we have to be experts on going to God in prayer. We, we can't expect to run and win when we don't eat healthy or when we eat sporadically. And to feast on truth. And I don't mean society's quick fix for truth. I mean, that, that's, you know, the quick fix for truth is, hey, whatever you feel is good. 
You can't feel healthy unless you are healthy. This is a truth that is undeniable. Every person that I've ever known who claims to have exchanged or have changed to a healthy diet exclaims, I can't believe how much better I feel. Even if they were pretty healthy before. A fish doesn't know what dry means. And healthy people don't know what feeling healthy is. You can't find truth in, your health, in yourself, spiritually speaking. Just want you to know that. It comes down from heaven. His word is truth. We need to know truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the true food. May we feed on him as true food every day. May we be in prayer with him moment by moment. May we be in the word regularly. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. I thank you that you have given us your word. Lord, we teach our kids week in and week out, hide the word of God in your heart. Lord, I pray that would be true for us as well, because in your word is life. Lord Jesus, you are life. May we lean into you. May we trust you and depend on you. May we invite you into our boat that we may arrive at our destination. Lord, we pray that you would carry us throughout this week. May we have the energy that we need to, to honor you, to, to lift you up, to give you praise, to be a light in our world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you so much for coming today. Grace and peace as you go from here.